Now again, this is perception, right? Historian is interpretation of documents. Um, because, I'm sorry, what's your name? Dennis. Dennis, so uh, as Dennis is saying, you know, so if you look, look at uh, the, the long view of Lincoln's writings, uh, was Lincoln an ally of African Americans? I would say absolutely yes. I, I think he believed that slavery was wrong. He always believed slavery was wrong. He always wanted to end. Was Lincoln a racist? Absolutely yes. <laughs> and people can say, well, you've got to judge him in the context of his time. In the context of his time, he's a racist. He wasn't as racist as oh, Jefferson sorry. Davis, <laughs> you know, or a lot of other white and uh, white northerners and southerners. He was far ahead of the curve compared to a lot of people, but there were white folks at that time who were much further ahead of the curve than him. So it's not like it was impossible for somebody, a smart, intelligent person, in 1860 or 1865 or 1848 to see race and gender and a host of other things in a, a different way. Right? It wasn't out. It wasn't uh, unheard of. So. I think I would, you know, as, as you said, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Uh, as Rebecca said, that you know, Lincoln is a great politician. Yeah, absolutely. He's smart. But does it mean that he doesn't believe what he says? I'm not sure. I, I think in Lincoln's ideal world, he would have been able to ship black folks out of the country. I don't think it takes away from the fact, because my students also, they say, well, then after the Battle of Antietam and the Emancipation Proclamation, and you know, he wants African-American troops, isn't he just using them because he needs more soldiers? I'm like, you know, that's a really good point. But I also bring up, well, does that take away from the fact that this guy is the only person to, in an, um, um, at the time when it's really unpopular to say, we should free them, he's the only one who steps in as a politician and says, yeah, let's do it. Why not? And people are telling him, don't do it, don't do it, it's really bad. Yeah. He's the only one with guts to do it. So, yes, he's a fantastic politician, but at the same time, he had the guts to do it. Yeah, but there are also other people who are far him ahead sooner. of them, absolutely. But that are not in that, uh, at yeah. least for me, not in that uh, position, powerful position of saying, you know, stamp to prove. Hmm. I was just going to confirm what she said. And I agree with Dennis when he talked about how we, you know, Lincoln grew. Over yeah, the years. Yeah. And if you look at his first inaugural address and if you analyze his second inaugural, you can see over the years how his attitude changes. Um, looking at those documents, yeah. looking at his speeches. And so I do, I think I think he was a great politician. But he obviously grew and I think his emotions did change on how he felt about equality a good bit. And you can look at the documents and see yeah. that. I, I I would absolutely agree that Lincoln uh, has this remarkable ability to maintain certain core principles, but also evolve, you know, change his thinking in a different way. Yeah, the reason he fights, it, it, it does, it changes over time. Yeah, and, and not in what we, we say waffling. Oh, you're waffling. I don't, I don't think Lincoln was a waffling. And in fact, he says to Frederick Douglass, because Frederick Douglass, when he meets with him, accuses him of equivocating on, on certain things. And Lincoln says, look, maybe I've done this, maybe I've done this wrong, but I have maintained, I've been consistent in these certain principles. I, I think he was right. Mm -hmm. How many of you uh, have seen the movie Lincoln? When I saw, I saw it here in Gettysburg, and people applauded it again. Some of you had that experience. I don't know. Last, last time I went to a movie where people applauded at the end, I was living in Heidelberg, Germany, 1974, 75, and the movie Patton. <laughs> I saw it in Patton Barracks, named yeah. after him, with like 300 GI. And I thought it was interesting. People applauded at the end, and uh, I. I there's a, okay, so this, I'll get back to some of the historical debates. My perception, again, this is just my perception, is the way that we want to remember Lincoln changes over time. And in the last decade, my perception, as I, I read what historians and, and other writers are doing about Lincoln or popular culture like the movie, is there seems to be a desire to uh, re-venerate Lincoln, remember Lincoln. Uh, and There's, I think, absolutely tremendous reason that Lincoln, I would argue, is our greatest president, I mean, by far. And in almost every poll of Americans since 1948 to the present, of who, whether historians or the, the public in general, of who the greatest presidents were, it's Lincoln and Washington are one and two, and usually Lincoln's first. So I'm not really sure why there's a need to regenerate Lincoln, but he's still held up pretty highly. 
it's the way we remember, and as I talked a bit about in that, that article that hopefully you read, uh, was it has a function for our present needs, right? Historical memory um, has certain purposes, and usually those purposes are based on what our society needs now. So in the article that you that, that I wrote about tradition forms us, African Americans in the antebellum period, what they need is to stake a claim to citizenship. And so they're remembering their past as people who fought for the Americans, forgetting the fact that actually most black folks, when they had the chance, they went and fought for the British or ran to the British. Because the British were saying, hey, you can be free if you come to our side. And they far outnumber the, the African Americans who fought for the Americans. However, most African Americans, slave and free, didn't fight for either side. By, those are by far the biggest numbers. So, <clears throat> the memory of uh, war made slavery. I'm sorry, but these purposes of historical memory change over time. How the war is remembered changes almost immediately after the Civil War. And as, as Steve mentioned, the, uh, there's this revision of the war where African Americans disappear from the war by the end of the 19th and early 20th century, and there's an emphasis on reconciliation. You get movies like Birds of the Nation. The Lincoln Memorial was an effort of reconciliation. I don't think there are any black people in the there's one who were invited to the unveiling of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, so this leads to a question about how we remember the Civil War, Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address, all these things today. And so present needs are constantly impinging on how we remember these things. Any of you like The Daily Show, John Stewart? Yeah. Well, it, 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 it uh, rehashes some of the things we're talking about, but it's entertaining. We take certain things as gospel. George Washington never told a lie. Benjamin Franklin invented everything. James Garfield was our first lasagna-loving cat president. <laughs> Lincoln. Is that loud enough? Here's one network's tribute to him during Black History Month. I am a contrarian on Abraham Lincoln, and I bemoan the fact that he's been mythologized. I believe the judge is referring to Lincoln's ability to kill vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you bemoan a president that most of us like? I prefer to look at Lincoln this way. At the time that he was the president of the United States, slavery was dying a, a natural death all over the Western world. Instead of allowing it... Okay, which is not true. Uh, no, it, it was, complete. It was on the wane in some parts, but in the United States, as you, as you also know, it's actually financially, it is growing. It is extremely viable. And it's it to die, or helping it to die or even purchasing the slaves and then freeing them, which would have cost a lot less money than the Civil War cost. Lincoln set about on the most murderous war in American history. Oh, right. <laughs> Compensated emancipation. Why didn't Lincoln think of that? That was, what's that? Oh, he did think of that. He spent, oh, he spent most of 1862 trying to convince the border states of Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, and West Virginia to free their slaves in exchange for money, and everybody said, because <laughs> 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 it wasn't economically feasible, and the slave states had a deeply vested socio political interest in maintaining a two tier culture based on cheap horse labor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why we're talking about slavery. <laughs> I mean, why are we even talking about slavery? It seems that wasn't really what the Civil War was about. Look, it's not even altogether clear if slavery was the reason uh, for secession. Sure. But largely, the impetus for secession was tariffs. Sure, unless he's talking about a slave named Tariff. Because <laughs> <laughs> in their own de declarations of secession, South Carolina, Georgia, and Mississippi all clearly put slavery as the number one issue for wanting to secede. And Mississippi well. saying, quote, <clears throat> Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. So I get to read into that. <laughs> Going on to say, though, although for future whitewashing purposes, please replace the word slavery with tariffs. All right. <laughs> for more on the issue, we talk to our senior black correspondent, Larry. Larry, thanks for being here. Larry. Uh, so, so, what about this idea that Lincoln should have just waited? Because slavery would have eventually died of natural causes. Uh, John, the South was so committed to slavery, Lincoln didn't die of natural causes. <laughs> if the free market was just about to 
against slavery then, why is it still going on in some places 150 years later? Slave trade is the literal exact opposite of free market. Yeah, but, but Larry, this isn't, just, uh, this isn't just the judge's opinion. There's articles, books, uh, some by libertarians, Confederate uh, uh, apologists. It is a, a, an industry, a school of thought. Do they teach history at this school? <laughs> <laughs> because their facts are all f***ed up. <laughs> I mean, these people think Lincoln started the Civil War because the North was ready to kill to end slavery, when the truth was the South was ready to die to keep slavery. You're welcome, libertarians. I just done your facts. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is very kind of you. I, I'll enjoy the emails thanking you for that. <laughs> that I will receive. What, what, what about this idea that, okay, that Lincoln could have stopped slavery by buying all the slaves, buying them? Yeah, that's how the free market works, yeah. When a product is bought up completely, it just goes away. That's why McDonald's model is 1,000 served, then we're out. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, buying all the slaves wouldn't have been practical. Do you know how much it costs for just one fine specimen that can work in your field and also represent you in the house? A breeder I'm talking about. Come on, John. What would you pay for such a versatile young bird? <laughs> this, this, this is very uncomfortable. <laughs> because we should never buy people! Right? <laughs> <laughs> the problem here is that Palatino's economic argument still considers people as though they're property. And, and the same people who feel the Civil War was too high a price have no problem shedding American blood for a more worthy cause. The Founding Fathers risked, as they like to tell us, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors for the freedom and independence they won and we have inherited. So it was heroic to fight a war for the proposition that all men are created equal, but when there's a war to enforce that proposition, that's whack? You know, there's something not right when you feel the only black thing worth fighting for is tea. <laughs> but I get it, I get it. That's a good war because it's about taxes. Taxation has become theft in America, and our sheep-like acceptance of it seems to avoid the moral issue of government taking property from us against our will. I, I know, I know. You, you think it's immoral for the government to reach into your pocket, rip your money away from its warm home, and claim it as its own property. Money that used to enjoy unfettered freedom is now conscripted to do whatever its new owner tells it to. Now, I know this is going to be a leap, but you know that sadness and rage you feel about your money? Well, that's the way some of us feel about people. <laughs> Thank you very much. So in terms of why it matters, um, why memory matters, and that's why, even though historians read that consensus, I mean, still, and I, I know that John Stewart and Fox are always going at each other, uh, but from very different perspectives. So whatever, whatever you are from a political spectrum doesn't matter, but I would argue that still this, in popular memory, just still come, these questions come up about how we remember the war, how we remember Lincoln. And interesting, part of the reason why I like that clip, because in some ways I think what Stewart does in this and the following segments is some of this remembering Lincoln, I think, in perhaps ways that somewhat paper over some of the complexities of Lincoln. We, we like simple stories, we like simple heroes. We like Rosa Parks as the lone woman who stood up against segregation and sparked the movement instead of Rosa Parks, who was the secretary of the NAACP, who knew they were looking for the poster child, who called Ed Nixon the lawyer when she got arrested, and, and the NAACP chapter there says, I think this is it, which I would argue makes her more heroic because she's really smart and savvy. Uh, and then you can apply the same to Lincoln. He's a savvy guy. He is flawed in many ways, but uh, he's a savvy guy. Which seems a bit uh, diminutive, right? Refer to Lincoln as a savvy guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get and uh, very briefly, so in terms of how it matters, um, in Gettysburg in 2004, the Africana Studies program wanted to bring this guy, John Sims, who uh, wanted to have an exhibition of the Confederate flag where he was going to hang a Confederate flag from a 13 foot wooden gallows. We were going to have students build it, put it in the center of campus. Got death threats. The president got death threats. I didn't get death threats. They didn't know how long. I said, let's put on a flatboard, flatboard truck and drive around the road in North Town. Uh, and 
uh, they ended up putting in the Schumacher Art Gallery with metal detectors. About 900 people came, and uh, but they came to a scaled down representation that John Sims did not like because he said it didn't represent his original vision of this, which eventually went up in Florida a few years later. Um, and there was a plane that flew over graduation at Gettysburg College later that spring with a banner protesting what they did here, the, this exhibition. Uh, the actual protest by the Sons of Confederate Veterans amounted to five guys with huge Confederate flags standing out in the street uh, in front of uh, Schmucker Art Gallery. But, the controversy it generated, I found intriguing. Um, yeah, I call it a proper way to hang a Confederate flag. So in terms of how we remember it, I would argue that even in remembering the Civil War as slavery as the central cause of the Civil War, even though most historians definitely agree, and the National Military Park, as you see, uh, has that perception, there's still a perception that it's an institution. Slavery caused the Civil War. We don't, so we might say, Slavery caused the Civil War. We wouldn't say slaves caused the Civil War. Okay. Right, so my question is, what about the individual agency and actions and decisions of, of the slaves themselves? What role did that play? And I would argue that, that much of this is important because uh, as in West African societies, there used to be a tradition where the way you insult somebody, particularly a man, is you say, you don't know your history. And if you receive that insult, especially in some of these more rural parts of West and Central Africa, you had to then assemble uh, your kin network, or the, it was a small town, and you had to recite your family history for seven generations back on both sides from memory. Oral society, they could do it. And you didn't just recite the names, you had to know stories. You had to know why those people mattered. And the reason you had to know why they mattered is because that was why you mattered. And because if you didn't know your past, and know why people mattered and how you came to be where you were, you would not be someone who could have effective solutions to march forward through the present and the future. And so people didn't know they passed, you didn't deserve respect. So that's how you demonstrate respect. And I would argue the same applies to us, of course. Of course I'd argue that out. In, in this question, uh, part of what I, I've been exploring it so in is the Underground Railroad because it strikes me how big an impact it had. Uh, when I first, um, about 10 years ago, Dickinson College asked me to come do a talk on the Underground Railroad in South Central PA, particularly Adams County. And I said, I, I don't, I, my research was in New England on African Americans, how they used the law in the colonial period and the early Republic period after the revolution. So I don't know anything about the Underground Railroad in South Central. PA. Uh, Pennsylvania, and in my head I'm thinking, I know what you people are thinking. You're thinking, so there's this black guy at Gettysburg College in this African American history. You must know about the Underground Railroad in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and so I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, give me $200. I said, okay. <laughs> and that's that really is what led to this project that kind of got put on the back burner for a while, but then I sort of picked up a few years ago again. Um, and because I didn't know anything about it, I thought, well, I want to think about it in a different way. Most of the work on Underground Railroad has been about who did what, what the, sort of the mechanics of it, which is a crucial, which is important. Deb McCausland knows far more about that than I do. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'm not going to replicate what they've done. They've done all the, the good work, the hard work. So what are the different ways that we could perhaps think about it? And started thinking about, well, so how did the Underground Railroad connect to law and conceptions of space? Because one of the questions that bedeviled historians for a long time is how did Americans, white and north, white southerners and white northerners, who had more in common than they had differentiated them in many ways, not I mean, there are several ways that are very different. How did they come to the point where they're willing to kill each other? And I think part of this is how they conceive of space. So there are popular conceptions of how the law works in particular spaces. For instance, this is an aerial view of the Arlington National Cemetery uh, outside of DC. So there are certain things we do in that space and don't do, right, in places like cemeteries. Uh, my oldest son, once we were living lived in New Hampshire when I went to grad school there, um, was bouncing a ball at a cemetery and was quickly told by somebody else, and he was like five years old, like, what, what are you doing bouncing a ball at a cemetery? So for instance, if we put a soccer field in a cemetery and we started playing soccer there, that's Diego Maradona, by the way, hand of God, 1986 World Cup for all this. <laughs> um, 
this will never happen because that space culturally, conceptually, and legally is designed for specific purposes. And even if there wasn't a law against it, my son was bouncing ball, there's no law against bouncing a tennis ball in a cemetery if you just don't do it. And so there are certain conceptions of how space works, what you're supposed to do in one space and not do in another space. Um, <coughs> so most antebellum white Americans, including many who are anti-slavery, they have little trouble conceiving of the South <coughs> as a place where slavery is okay. It can happen there. We're fine with slavery in the southern states. Territories, uh, and then it gets a little more complex. In the North, no, even though we know slavery existed in the North for quite some time. So there are these changing conceptions of space over time. So this is a map from 17, or I'm sorry, 1690. It's a Dutch map of North America, British North America. <coughs> so you can think about, so how is space signified there? How are they dividing up primarily by this coloration? And then over time, this is 1755, based on a British cartographer's map. And you can start to see these divisions of space by colonies, but it also extends out west. But you know, there's kind of the, the Mississippi River provides a boundary where the frontier is. Of course, all of this is still pretty much its frontier in the 1770s. But there's this notion, and even though these are European maps, this is what Americans are seeing. And the, the, the conception many Americans have, colonial Americans, Americans as they become uh, a country, is that their space extends quite a ways out west. That this is uh, for settlement, even though Native Americans are still living and controlling many parts of those areas. <coughs> it starts to get a little more defined in territories until you have, this is 1784, um, and the territories and the coloration that is potentially ex expanding even further, where they're conceiving of the West, even then starting to conceive of the West as an area that is unsettled, even though they, they know Native Americans living there, and is for their, uh, is available for their opportunity. Now, when slaves run away, and so slavery exists in all of this, all of this area. There's slavery and slaves. Uh, Vermont never really has formal legalized slavery. But so none of this space is divided by how people think of where slavery belongs and where it doesn't belong in the 18th century. It's all over the slavery, as well as so. And when slaves run away, they don't cross any kind of significant legal boundaries. Uh, in the 18th century and even into the early 19th. So if slavery runs from Alabama to Mississippi later, it's going to cause, it, or I'm sorry, when you have Alabama and Mississippi, they're not going to cause any significant problem running from Alabama and Mississippi. But if they, care, if they run away to the north, that's going to be a huge problem. And there you see how they conceive the nation by the end of the 18th century. And for instance, there's this guy, Blackstone, uh, famous the legal commentary that much American law was based on. And pursuing property in the formulation of recaption, there is no real legal problem. So for instance, if your horse runs away and it goes into a neighbor's property, you can, you can trespass on that neighbor's property to get your property, your horse, without any legal consequences. Your neighbor can't take you to court and say, well, they trespassed my property. It's okay to do that because your property ran away. And in some ways, this applies to slavery as well in these earlier conceptions of where the legal boundaries lay. You can pursue your property in other colonies, even other states, no big deal. Uh, there is a uh, instance in 1797 where Tom and Susan, a married couple, run away from Rhode Island into Massachusetts. And <clears throat> Tom breaks horses. He finds work near Worcester, Mass. And Susan works in a smallpox hospital there. Their owner's son tracks them down. Uh, they hide, and they're being assisted, probably by some free black people in Massachusetts, as well as some sympathetic whites. And the owner says, federal law is clear against any person either concealing or harboring fugitives, and pursues the case in court. I was never able to find out exactly what happened. But this case didn't get any press. They crossed a state boundary, 
1797, but it was no big deal. Massachusetts isn't saying, hey, what, what are you doing coming over to our state pursuing our slaves? It, it, it doesn't matter. And the same thing would have happened in the South. By contrast, uh, so running away didn't challenge any kind of uh, regional or sectional or state identity or any legal systems. In the case of Tom and Susan, by contrast, 50 years later, in 1848, uh, Hester runs away, sorry, 1847, Hester runs away from Hagerstown, which is about 50 minutes. You go out to A.B. Chambersburg and south in 81, you get to Hagerstown just over the border. <laughs> and she ran from Hagerstown to Carlisle, which is right up 81. It's a straight shot, follow Mountain Ridge up to 81, or to Carlisle. It causes a riot, leads to 28 free black men being in prison, court trials, at least one death, a uh, lawyer in the trial, uh, prosecuting those who are helping Hester escape, who does eventually uh, escape permanently, tells the jury that if they don't find for the plaintiff who's trying to prosecute uh, the people who are, are helping Hester, if they don't find for the plaintiff, he said, it's going to lead to a war that will light up the land. And, and there are plenty of people predicting that slavery and these problems are going to lead to a civil war. This is of one woman, one woman who decides to run away. And part of it is because she crosses a legal boundary in 1847 that has come to mean something that it did not mean prior to that. So uh, I conceive of this like fault lines. This is a San Andreas fault. The fault lines where two tectonic plates are pushing and rubbing against each other until the tension gets released and it explodes. And the Mason-Dixon line and you know, extend out to the Ohio River uh, functions in some ways similar to that. So this is Adams County. <laughs> this is a farm. Uh, the Mason Dixon line is in this picture. But can, can you see it? We can't point and say that's where the Mason Dixon line is. Uh, you can see it from the air nowadays because of the legal boundary. Right? So there are farms that are Maryland and there are farms that are Pennsylvania. And so that's where now you can actually identify from above where the Mason Dixon line is by these, these patterns. But certainly in, and you, you would have been able to do this if you had been able to take an arrow page, you would have been able to see similar kinds of patterns in the antebellum period. But when you're walking across it, you can't see it. But these spaces, this line, comes, as we know, to have tremendous importance in the antebellum period. So this is a called the Moral Map of the United States from 1837. Where, it, I mean, so this is one of these So, is this just coincidence? Like, if you were showing this to your students, is it just coincidence that the South happens to be dark? <laughs> <laughs> if this was the only map like this, or if there wasn't any other context, discussions about slavery, and this, this, as you can probably guess, this is produced by people who are sympathetic to abolitionists. Right. This is from a book called The Legion of Liberty, ironically published in Texas as well. <laughs> but, uh, but they clearly wanted to depict the South as a, a, a dark, as a negative space. And so, you know, there, there's a process that changes that signification of space, of the South as dark and the North as, as light. Some of the research I did on uh, newspaper articles before 1810, there's, I could only find uh, several hundred newspapers that I searched through, two articles that concerned the rendition of black people running away from slave owners. And both of those were about uh, slaves running from southern states into Spanish-held territory, one in Texas and the other case in Florida. And those people at that time were saying, this is the 18, or, uh, sorry, the 17, one was in 1790 and the other one in about 1801, I think. Both of them at a the time were saying, look, the federal government needs to step in and do something about this. Because they know that the Spaniards are sympathetic. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to help us return our slaves. And the federal government does a step in and do something about this. It's going to lead to a war between us and the Spaniards because we're going to arm up and we're going to go get our slaves. I mean, well, this is eerily kind of what happens, right, a half a century later. <clears throat> this is after the Civil War, this map, the historical geography map by John F. Smith. Uh, that's in the Smithsonian. 
And you can see what it, it comes to mean, God's blessing, liberty, God's curse, slavery. And along these little branches of this, this is Jamestown, this is Plymouth, that are the root of liberty or cur the curse. And along these little branches, there are things just like Mason Dixon line, Dred Scott case, and a uh, host of other things like that, um, that lead to these negative perceptions. Now, we know that North was absolutely intertwined with slavery. Right? So, so Dennis, I assume you're from Mass? No, New Hampshire. New Hampshire, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and, and so there are some others from England and Connecticut and other places. You, you, you know, you're familiar with those big mill buildings, right? That have been turned into apartments or museums or whatever. Uh, they're making money off of Southern cotton. They're even making money. This is one of the, This is how intertwined slavery was in a national economy. Certainly, a Southern economy, the national economy. So, uh, there, there's a slave in the 1840s who says that, uh, yeah, my master always provided me with two sets of clothes, two sets of clothes a year, and the summer set and the winter set. And the winter set was this thick wool. And this thick wool, it was so thick and kind of unrefined that if I had a scratch, an itch of my back, I didn't need to reach back. I could just go like this, and it would scratch it for me. That clothing was prob almost certainly made in one of these northern factories. So slaves are picking cotton which is being sold to Europe and all over the place, but as well as the North, turned into linens and clothes. Some of it's being turned into clothes that Northern uh, manufacturers are making to sell to slave owners to clothe their slaves. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the, 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 this all works together. And so this kind of conception of space of the North as uh, liberty is a bit misleading. Right? It's a certain way to remember their past and remember history. So what gets lost in translation goes back to what uh, Stephen Frank said about, you know, so who gets lost? Well, African Americans. How, do you know David Walker? David Walker's appeal, mm -hmm. one of the most important documents in American history, I would argue, is some of you nodding. Uh, David Walker's appeal in 1829 puts out a, a document kind of mimicking the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as a preamble, has four articles where he criticizes slavery, criticizes colonization, criticizes even African Americans for not doing enough. A host of other things, a black guy born in North Carolina, is in Boston, dies in 1830, nobody knows why, probably natural causes. Uh, his, David Walker's appeal, we, it gets found in the South, black sailors and even white sailors are taking it in the southern ports, they're distributing it to slaves and free black people. <laughs> It's getting found inland, and because, because we know slaves have these oral networks of communication where they can repeat things, we don't know how far it spread, but southern leaders don't like it. The governor of Georgia and the governor of Virginia put a price on Walker's head. They write to the mayor of Boston and said, you've got to do something about this guy. The mayor of Atlanta does the same thing. The mayor of Boston says, hey, look, I don't like what he's saying, but it's a free country. I can't stop him. Um, there's a revolt, an attempt to revolt in North Carolina that's blamed on David Walker's appeal. We don't know for certain if it was a cause. It keeps popping up in different places, and it's causing problems for Southerners, especially in those counties that are majority black. Like along the Shenandoah, there's a range of black majority counties. That's what John Brown was hoping to connect to. Uh, in South Carolina, Mississippi, a host of other places. And so, David Walker uh, has a greater impact than we typically think, but that story isn't going to get told in antebellum America or post-reconstruction America about the influence of David Walker. And you can, the whole thing is online, by the way. Uh, 